What was your role in the Netflix documentary? Um, my role, basically, is, is what I do day to day in my BBC Newcastle job, and that is covering the football club. Um, I didn't have to do anything that I wouldn't normally do. It, it was literally a case of um, a camera following me around on a match day on, on several occasions, um, filming our commentaries, using the commentaries, um, and filming interviews that attempted to put the club into some sort of context. I think because of the global nature of the series, there was um, a concern that people wouldn't know much about Sunderland, wouldn't know where Sunderland was, and needed to some sort of perspective and context to put Sunderland into. And I was used, I think, as a sort of narrator in that sense to give, um, to, put, to put Sunderland on the map, if you like, in one sense, but to also give a thread through the series with our commentaries and with interviews to give the story of the season a narrative. I mean, you touched up on it there, but how was the BBC also involved as well? Um, BBC Newcastle, as it turned out, were quite heavily involved because if you watch the series, you hear Simon Pride, who presents the evening phone in Total Sport. He's in it quite a lot, I hear him on the radio. Um, you actually see him interviewing Chris Coleman at one point, you see him in the studio when. Stuart Donald and Charlie Methan were, were guests of the Total Sport programme. Uh, of course, Gary Bennett and I, through the commentaries and interviews, um, and various other members of BBC Newcastle actually pop up through the series in, in one guise or another, whether they be interviewing or whether they're on the radio uh, or at games. Um, so in the end, I mean, looking through the eight episodes, there's quite a heavy presence for the radio station. Was there anything that surprised you during the film and how the how it actually how the production works? Um, I think it's the one thing that surprises a lot of people is that how many man hours go into filming these series. You might see um, someone on screen for ten seconds, twenty seconds, thirty seconds, but in fact that interview may have taken three hours to, to film and do, um, and in the edit suite then it gets cut right down. The the sheer labour of love, if you like, that went into making this series. I, would, I think, you know, when you hear that they're going to make a documentary about Sunderland Football Club, you expect to see cameras at matches, you expect to see interviews. But I was surprised by the depth in which they tried to get in underneath the skin of Sunderland, if you like. You know, the, the number of fans they, they pulled on board to, to interview, the number of businesses they used to go and visit, the places they used to go and visit. It literally was a case almost of no stone unturned. To, to make the documentary, and I, I was surprised by that. I, I did think that was, um, you know, it, it was a bit of an eye opener, if you like, even for someone who works in the business, to, to see how that that documentary was made, and the sheer number of hours that were filmed, uh, that then actually gets concertina down into the eight episodes. Did you have to hold back any when you were doing filming or any views, or did it change your views on anyone in particular when you were doing it? No, not really. My, I think my I think I'm always trying to be objective in my job anyway. Yes, I can be passionate about Sunderland, I'm passionate about the matches and I want Sunderland to do well and I want to win, but not at the expense of trying to um, delude anybody or, or pull the wool over anybody's eyes. If, if Sunderland are playing poorly or a player's playing poorly, I can see it, the fans can see it, everybody can see it. There's no point trying to dress it up as something that it's not. So in that sense, I just carried on as I normally do. Um, and I think that's the, the, the fairest way to, to everybody. I think because if you start trying to be something you're not, bearing in mind the season's nearly a year long, at some point you'll get caught out. You're best just to be honest. Um, and I think that way, um, you know, the, I think honesty counts. And I think you know, that way people actually also see you from a different perspective they can see you know they, they will trust you more if you're honest in your appraisal of what's happening on the pitch or what's happening at the football club and i mean the northeast it's referred to quite a bit as an important place for football how important was it to shine a light on this part of the country i think it's um i think very very important the light was shone on sunderland the northeast we hear so much about the northeast and its passion for football um and but you know globally even in England, Wales, Scotland, United Kingdom, 
that the North East is isolated. It seems strange to say in the modern world when you can get to London in three hours on the train, but it does feel like you're in a little pocket of the country which um, people don't seem to know a lot about. There's lots of, um, I think, a lot of misinformation in the South, especially about what the North East is like now. And I think most people in the South, if you were to say to them, uh, what's your image of the North East? I think many of them would still say um, coal mines, heavy industry, um, and the old cloth cap syndrome. I'm, you know, it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. It's one of the most beautiful parts of the world to live in. It has got industry still, but it, you know, significantly it's moved on. It has moved on into the 21st century, but not at the expense of not having a nod to its roots and, and realising just how important to the area all those heavy industries were. They were important, they are still important, but the North East has moved with the times. Um, and I think it's great that there is now a window on that and, and people can see just what a fantastic place it is.